Okay, I think this seems what we have today. I can start to talk a little bit. Um, I'll talk about some of the current issues in the field of music and copyright today. As some of you might know, as IMC, we are publishing every six months an intellectual property rights report, which is sent to members by email that covers the significant issues relating music and copyright around the world. And then it tries to give some aspects of those issues from the point of different stakeholders' view. And these reports usually are published in March and September in order to cover like late summer or like in the beginning, just after New Year, uh, initiatives of the governments changing a new law or bringing up a new proposal. And this September 2011 issue is what you got in your hand that my friend distributed to you. And it hasn't been published by IMC yet, but I thought it would be useful that you have it in the hand. And then when we talk today, you can actually reference it back when you go home. And as I said, I will choose like some issues to talk about, but there are, of course, a lot of them. And when you got this kind of corporate-related workshops or conferences, the most of the issues that you hear are actually how you download a discography in three minutes, or uh, how your sweet little electronic device become a pirate, or like, are anyone is stealing my copyright or works on that way? Or actually, those pirates are not so bad people, in fact. So I'm not gonna talk about those things primarily today, we can do, but that's not my aim. My aim is much more talking about some of the issues that uh, is more about the legal side of the copyright law and much more about the use of the copyright law for your daily life. And another reason is it's really difficult to come up with a 100% successful anti-piracy policy. And yeah, what I've chosen for today is actually, as you can also see in the handouts, first of all, is the duration of copyright protection. Uh, those familiar with the copyright law and copyright policy might have heard that around two weeks ago, a uh, European Union has accepted a new law that ex extends the protection in the sound recordings and the protection for performers of music and for the producers of sound recordings from 50 years to 70 years. So new extension of copyright protection for plus 20 years. It has created a lot of controversy in the industry by different stakeholders. Everybody had, uh, most of the people opposed that change and some of the right holders were very fond of that. And we're going to talk about that and look at it more closely. And the other issue is this is something that I have seen in the field of copyright law lately. Um, if you ever had a look at the basic copyright information, copyright says that copyright is a set of exclusive rights that gives you the right to say, you can use my work, or you cannot use, or if you use, you can use it under these conditions. And that means the exclusivity of the copyright law. But with the technologies, there are many instances now that asking this prior authorization is not possible anymore. Um, people first use the works and then try to discuss, or like try to take down their content from the platforms. And they, it's uh, for me, as being also an academician, actually, is uh, like kind of quite significant change of paradigm in the field of copyright because it moves from prior authorization to a subsequent action that to take afterwards. So I'll look at that more closely, and then I'll also try to do at the beginning of every session to give some basic information about what it means, what copyright means, and what those rights and what exclusivity really means. And the other one will be Fair Music Project. 
Uh, those who come to IMC and EMC meetings frequently have already seen maybe several times before. There is a project of fair music. IMC and EMC are also part of that one. It has started by Music Information Center of Austria and the founder is <laughs> on the project is also sitting here actually and it's getting bigger and bigger and it's a really, really nice project. And it is from my point of view, from my perspective, is a really sustainable and reasonable answer to many of the copyright questions that we face today because it looks at the nature of the copyright from a rights holder, from an artist perspective and tries to give core protection for the artists in their relations with the companies that commercialize their works. And I'll talk about it much more, but the basic idea is Fair Music Project develops fair music contract standards and then an agency will be able to assess those, assess the contracts in the industry and label them with the fair music label so the consumers know when they buy or when they see a music that project is a fair music project and the artists are paid equally and then on a good way and it's good for consumer and for the also as a kind of alternative to piracy, people, a lot of people say that I don't want to pay for music. Music companies are exploiting all the artists and get all the money anyway, so why should I do that? So that's also a good answer to that one. It also supports uh, less known music and tries to support more cultural diversity. And normally today, this session was being done with another colleague of mine uh, he's a very well-known copyright lawyer who works in World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, the acronym is like WIPO, and WIPO is the body like UNESCO within UN dealing with intellectual property rights. He was not able to be here, so that's why you're going to have half an hour more talk of me. So in that, <laughs> at that extra time, I thought like, give you actually decide what to talk about. Some of the issues could be like new ways of exploitation. As I said, it could be piracy if you really insist because everybody wants to talk about that. And it could be a project called Global Repertoire Database. If David Medimo from WIPO, if he was here, he was going to talk about this. There's a project called Global Repertoire Database and another parallel project ran by WIPO called International Music Registry. He was going to talk about this International Music Registry. And I'm personally very much involved with the uh, development of this Global Repertoire Database project. So um, if you have heard about it, I should be able to answer some of the questions. That was covered in the last issue of this IPR report of IMC2. And another issue could be a collective management of copyright issue, which is also very much discussed around the world. It could be any other thing that you might think of, so you can suggest it if we have any remaining time in the end, or if you still have some energy to talk something more on something more. So, does that sound okay? Does it sound interesting? Or, <laughs> or not at all? <laughs> yeah, please. I mean, intervene and ask a question on the way if you think that you are not following or you're not able to understand what's going on. Because it sometimes gets a little bit technical and not everybody's trained as a lawyer or not always deal in his everyday life with the copyright related issues. So, about the duration of copyright protection, uh, this is still not in public domain, it's a protected work, but I'm using it for informational purposes so it doesn't fall in a <laughs> corporate protection <laughs> discussion. Um, so, when we are talking about the protection of copyright, so it's actually really important to first understand and identify whose rights are we talking about. Because 
First of all, we have like two basic regimes around the world relating copyright law, which is for one of them is called the copyright law system that relates much more to Anglo-American countries and a general picture we call it common law system. And we have author's right regime, which is typically seen in the continental European countries that we call in the legal system generally called civil law regime. And the copyright regime actually doesn't make a distinction for copyright protection between the author, composer of the music and the performer and producer of the music. It just recognizes the copyright both for the performer and the author of it. An author's rights regime, on the contrary, actually makes a distinction between them because author's rights regime like historically focuses the protection on the author itself and then sees it as the rights of the author in his works rather than the copyright regime that focuses the protection on the work which is protected. And as a result of that, we have a separate neighboring rights also called related rights regime in Europe that is recognized for the performers of the music and also for the producers of sound recordings in which the performances of performers are fixed. Uh, this was the reason for that what actually to protect and the reward the investment of the companies producing recordings. And when we get that, we see around the world variety of lengths in different jurisdictions. So, when we, does it come? Hello? Oh, okay. So, um, when we look at the copyright regime, uh, we usually talk about the underlying musical composition. So when you hear a music on a recording, there are people performing that music and there's an underlying musical composition whose writer is not necessarily the performer of that music. So uh, there are international conventions around the world that actually set standards for the countries for minimum protection of copyright law. And that is a way actually to harmonize the protection for everywhere, so when the music and culture travels across the countries, so the right holders know or at least can assume what kind of protection that they can expect in another country. And one of the biggest of them in copyright of on author's right is Bern Convention. It exists for more than 100 years now and that sets the term of protection as a minimum the life of the author um, plus 50 years after his or her death. And the EU countries and the EU law recognizes this life plus 70 years principle for the authors. So in the US also the main principle is actually life of the copyright owner plus 70 years. But US system doesn't make any distinction as I said between the authors and performers. But EU does. And for the other part we have performers and producers. So as we said, these are related rights, which doesn't originate from the origin, from the creation of the work that you write or that you compose, but it focuses on the work that is performed and recorded. So it's only limited to that sound recording that you listen. For instance, when you have a CD, so there are like 10 compositions in that CD. That means like 10 songs there. So, when those songs are played on the radio, both the composer of those songs and the performers of those songs are getting royalties. But for instance, a same song is performed by another artist in another concept. The composer and the author of that work is still paid, but the performer of the original, the first version, is not paid anymore, but the only other performer 
who performs the other work gets paid. So it's only for the performance, only for the performance that they have. Also for the sound recordings, only for that sound recording that they produced. So if when someone else has produced that work, that gets paid and then the other's right stops there. But with the authors and composers right, it's always there. So whoever plays or whoever uses it in any way still gets royalties from the usage of that work. And on that way, again, for the performers and producers, it's also an international recognized right. And WIPO, again, has a treaty called WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty. And, and that sets the term of protection for performers and producers of sound recordings as 50 years computed from the end of the year when the work is produced. For the performers, is when the performances are fixed, but for the producers of phonograms, when the work is published. So actually, theoretically, the right of the producers can go some years further than that of the performer if the work is not published for the first five years, for instance. Um, what we have as a problem that uh, created those controversy is that 50 years protection in Europe just has been extended as 70 years. And normally, as I said, in the US, we don't have per se performers' rights or rights of producers. And there is no specific right actually recognized for producers. But in practice, what happens sometimes is most of the recording contracts Maybe Cynthia can also help on that one as working at the US Corporate Office. Most of the recording contracts are made in a setting, I mean, in a setting called work made for hire, where the artists had to buy out all of their rights to the record producers and then have like kind of employment-like contract where they get a certain amount of money and then they don't have the right to pursue any further claims on those works. In that case, US law says the copyright exists for 95 years from the uh, publication of the work or 120 years from the time, from the year that the performances are fixed, whichever is shorter. So, what is the discussion about that is, well, in, the, in many countries and also obviously in a setting like European Union where a lot of countries exist, the way of lawmaking is you make impact assessments, analyze the market, and you commission a study, and then you look at the results, and then you decide whether you need a law or not. The main reason of the controversy in that law was uh, European Union Commission the study and also a lot of academic institutions ran their own studies which all found that EU shouldn't extend the corporate protection but they still did so that was one of the main reasons and one of the reasons that they said was actually um, because the protection is protection starts on the year, at the end of the year, when the works are fixed, produced. So for instance, if you are a young artist having a recording on at 17 years old, protection for that album finishes when you are 68. So if you live 90 years, so the rest of your life, you don't have protection in your work. So they said like at the later ages of the artist, where they are not able to perform anymore, that could be a guarantee for their life. So they can still earn royalties from recordings that they made in the early ages. And the other one was actually the inequality with the authors in terms of the term of protection. Both performers are performers and the composers 
are contributing to a musical work with a great creativity. So sometimes you don't know the composer of many music, but you know them with the performer of that. So the, one of the classical examples given to that one is Frank Sinatra, who makes a lot of songs very famous, but rarely composed any. And the other one was inequality with the US. And in that sense, actually, it was a little bit confused assessment. Because in the first proposal of the law, you said the extension should be from 50 years to 95 years, because the protection for the sound recordings in the US is 95 years. But as I just explained, that is not really the fact. It is only for certain contracts and that is a situation where the right is actually given to the producers. So that was like kind of this 95 as a number that I thought it could be good. And the other one, the other reason was extra source of income for session musicians. Are you familiar with the term of session musicians? You are, most of you are yeah, musicians and so you know that what it is. So the law also proposed which was a kind of a very nice feature, actually, in the law. So normally, usually, the featured artists in the recordings, recordings are entitled with the, um, the most of the royalties coming from the performance or recording of the performances. And typically, session musicians' contracts are a buyout anyway. And the law suggests that the record companies should spare 20% of their earnings during the extended period to a special fund that would eventually go to session musicians. So that, that is actually one of the good things about law, which should be there in any ways. And the other one is, that I said, the possibility to use the music longer now. So because of the technological progress, we are now able to use different music from all around the world on different platforms for a much longer time. Now we have more access to music rather than the old things. So it's not anymore like scratched CDs or that kind of things. It's digital and in stairs all the time. And there were also another, actually, actually before coming there, uh, there is also another good thing in the law which uh, was ensured in the end of it, which is um, if the record companies do not exploit, do not commercialize the works of the artist during this extended period, for instance, after this 50 years, if the record company is not anymore commercializing or distributing the work, after a year, the performer can claim those recordings and then can do it on its own. So, which is also very protective and nice measure. And the other one is called clean slate provision, where actually for this extended period, performers have the right to rediscuss their contracts with the record companies rather than being imposed the same deductions and the royalty structure that was set in the previous contracts. It is starting from the new repertoire, yes. Yeah. No, it is to be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and these are actually the reasons for the uh, copyright extension. And the, again, the ideas against that was actually the main criticism was the main criticism suggests that it's only for superstars and celebrities because like Mick Jagger, Cliff Richard was one of the like vocal supports of all this change who had recordings from 50s and 60s who would fall in the public domain in the coming two years. And they are still famous and then they still can earn from those recordings and it's important for them to have this 
extension. This similar, this similar extension was done in the U.S. The, you know, in the United States, when we extended our copyright protection for an additional 20 years, it was actually called the Mickey Mouse Amendment because Mickey Mouse was going to go into the public domain. Yeah. And so, um, God forbid that he do so, it was extended for an additional 20 years. And that was a big motivator and it was a big source of contention because there were a lot of policy arguments against that. Because in the US Constitution, in Article 1, Actually, Congress is charged with promoting science and knowledge. And the big argument against extension is if you continue to deprive the public from using works that would, would have fallen into the public domain, how much more are you really promoting useful arts? So, yeah. so it's, it's interesting to see it's the same exact absolutely. arguments we no, had back in yeah. 1998. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people, for instance, say it's on the blogs nowadays, first Mickey Mouse, now Beatles. And Mick Jagger, so. <laughs> Same thing. Yes. Uh, I want to ask uh, what happens if uh, a digital art is produced? That's exactly the same. In which way are you? Uh, no performance, but. Uh, yeah, well, it's the, it's the fixation of the. Digital music. Yeah. That's okay. the fix well, the. Uh, well, the copyright protection, like the author's rights protection, starts to exist as long as you create it. But you're able to claim it when you fix it in a tangible format. Well, at least theoretically tangible, like something listenable format. So that could be, it could be even the score. Like the sheet music is also writing that one. And then afterwards, that is the production of it. And then afterwards, every reproduction of that master recording is actually like a right of the authors and the yeah. performers to claim rights. So if you produce it digitally, every copy of that digital master is subject to copyright law. OK, I have uh, another example. For example, if, you, if I am... Uh composer who is uh, composing electronic music, but I, if I'm not involved into electronics, I uh, sometimes use the help of a technician. Mm -hmm. So I'm composing the piece, so I'm the composer, but uh, the realization is made by a technician. Yes. So the technician is theoretically the performer. Yes. Um, this is actually an area where uh, the law differs in different countries. And there are quite many countries that makes technicians, that recognize technicians as a performer. And so there are countries that makes them actually, according to the contribution, can put it in as a producer too. So that's actually much more relating to the national law and how it is described there. But it could be a performer. Or it could be a producer too. Could it, could it also be that the, the, the date of fixing in a digital example or a virtual example, which is easy to imagine, okay. is when it's uploaded onto a site that is in the public, that is available to the public. That would also be the case, yeah. would it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uploading as downloading is a way of reproduction of the music. So coming back to the ideas against that, it's like uh, this protection is in favor of the companies more than the artists, I said. And the following argument for that is this is not a good thing for the artists, for the performers themselves, without having a certain guarantees for the performers. So most of the performance but most of the performers, when they enter into contracts with recording companies, they usually give exclusive rights to recording companies anyway. And the, those are the companies who are actually later commercializing those works and then mostly giving a lump sum money at the beginning of the contract and then the earnings coming later 
are for the benefit of the recording companies. And so people say if EU really intended to protect performers, the protection could have been limited to performers only and not actually extended for the producers too. So that was one of the ideas. It's very difficult to technically and legally structure something like that, having a protection on a matter, on a subject matter, into which there are two different right holders and excluding one of them, but still it could have been kept for the for instance, only performances and the reproduction of that one without giving any uh, protection to producers. So, yeah, as I said, they, the same things they said, the real problem is contractual. And the main issue that the artists, the main problem that the artists have is actually their weaker position in their negotiation powers towards the recording companies. And because they are not usually able to discuss at the early ages of their career, or unless they are celebrity or like very well-known artists, they are not able to actually negotiate good terms for themselves. And the real role of the law should focus on these contractual guarantees in favor of the performers and the national laws to protect them against the like further exploitation of the record companies rather than just extending it for 20 more years, which will still the same for them, but would last longer. And yeah, a lot of people also said there is no ground for comparison with the US system or like with the author's right because they are based on the different subject matter. And as I also explained very briefly, the system in the US is based on, on a completely different reality and then it's not a there's no performers right or like there's no sound uh, producers right anyway. And one of the other things, one of the other ideas was actually very practical. A lot of people thought that's a very bad PR for copyright law in times like this. A lot of people are more and more choosing for piracy and then everybody questions the necessity of copyright law in many occasions and having this kind of like extended protections and then trying to get laws more in favor of the companies rather than the artists themselves created a like big tension also like extra tension against corporate protection which is not very good for the actual protection of the artists and musicians so that was the general thing about it. So what I was trying to do is actually just like to give the different views. So we can talk a little bit further about that if you have any other questions on this. We can move to other issue. I think it's much better to have the discussion on it when we have it rather than when we finish all the other subjects. Do you have any other further questions on that? Um. Should not be added at what is the discussion that um, it really starts to work if you start selling in large quantities. Um, so, um, in the, the field of jazz where I'm working, uh, when music produced or CD is made, you talk about hundreds of records where all this law and remuneration uh, and rights things only start to work if you s sell thousands, if not more. Can you comment on that? Uh, well, I mean, that's much more about the, uh, I think, economical point rather than a legal point, because it's just that kind of as a value, it starts to cost and earn something after a certain number, and then it becomes a real issue afterwards. So, um, well, I mean, when you look at it from a practical point of view, Copyright is mainly an issue when it starts to earn money. Um, also, in a way, copyright protection is very much tend to intervene when someone is 
starting to earn money from the usage of that work. That's the same example we've seen with the internet service providers, for instance, or like the internet connection providers. So they are also earning a lot of money because people are able to download in huge amounts and then they need better connections and better lines. But legally, there is no grant in claiming copyrights at the moment. Now also countries are trying to elaborate on that one. But, uh, but apart from the recording and the numbers, if you have any kind of experience on that, what to comment, that would be great, actually. The, the comment, uh, just picking up on Vuta's point, is that um, the performing right and the mechanical right, as we refer to it, yeah. uh, now are becoming closer. They're still two distinctly different rights. But, for example, in the, in the UK, now PRS for Music is one yeah. company, one organisation. And we also know that there's sometimes inequality with the way royalties are collected, even, even between European member societies. Yeah. And of course, when you bring in the US, uh, the mechanical rights mm -hmm. are, are always months and months and months before you actually realize any of those royalties from sales of sound production in, in the US. It is and, true. You know. yeah. uh, that's uh, quite an important point. I mean, um, I didn't plan this one as a like, kind of general basic copyright information session, but it's worth actually touching on that one when it comes. So we have performing rights and mechanical rights in the works. Mechanical rights is, they refer to the mechanical reproduction of the compositions of the work. So when you have a composition, and when a record company wants to produce it as a CD or a digital copy, they actually mechanically reproducing that work. And then you are entitled to get royalties for your reproduction right, which is mechanically reproduced. But when your work is, for instance, played in public places or played on radio and TV, so you have performing rights, which is about the performance of the music. And now you get different royalties collected from different people. However, one of the issues that actually uh, confuses most of the things nowadays, in 1996, WIPO created a new right, which is called making available right. Yeah, my US colleague can also, might also want to comment on that one because it doesn't uh, apply in the US, and it is also understood on a different way there, so that's also created a little bit. Anyway, so it's a long discussion, but making available right is to make the works available on a place, from a place, and at a time individually chosen by the consumers. So if you go to an internet anytime, in any room, any place, you can click and watch it. That's making available. So the change of that one, the, ch uh, the difference of that one from the normal radio play, for instance, is radio play is programmed. So you are actually passive. You just listen what is planned and programmed for you. But with this one, you can go and choose what to listen. And it is different than the normal reproduction. It's not CD prepared for you there. You go, click, and then you can listen it on demand. You don't have to have a copy. You can have. But still, it is just a plate for you. So it's, in a way, mechanical reproduction. In another way, it's performing. But it is actually, it was actually, newly created right for the purposes of distribution on internet. But what happened in practice, uh, most of the licensing agencies saw the opportunity that they're already licensing mechanical rights and performing rights. So that's the combination of those two rights. Let's license them as performing and mechanical. So to make a work available, you actually go to collecting society to get mechanical 
rice for the mechanical collecting system and to get performing rice. But you don't clear the one right and one license specific for making available as such. You say that you want to use it for the making available, right? But you use these two different licenses. So that makes, for instance, um, separate part of the rights from collecting societies, for instance, and then license them separately. And, well, I think it was a missed opportunity, and then this could have been used to create a new, uh, more flexible and more access-based right for the distribution of music on internet. Um, talking about music distribution on the internet, I Wondering if you can tell us a bit about the Creative Commons. Of course I can. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, as musicians, we would want to have our royalties. But now, yes. because of the internet and downloads, uh, sometimes it's very, very difficult to monitor. I know with new softwares coming mm -hmm. from WIPO and stuff, it will be available. But I heard about that, and I want to know what we think we should think about that. absolutely um, i'm personally i mean as a practitioner and as like being a little bit academician i believe that the copyright should be controlled by the author by the creator or the performer of that one so which include which includes to decide on how to use that work. And when you are not very well-known artist, for instance, you might want to share your works for free with many people. And if you're an academician especially, you are get paid from your university for your work. And you are usually pursuing an idea to be extended around the world. So it's for you much better that people read your articles so they can get benefit from that or they can understand what you think. So it's much better for you that people read your articles rather than you get paid for that one. So for instance, for the academic field, Creative Commons is very much used, very widely used, and I think very good idea. So because that gives the author the right to act independent from the publishing contract or the recording contract that they have. Artists should be able to use Creative Commons. I totally support that. But for those who are pursuing um, economic life from their creation, is not a sustainable model from my point of thinking. One of the things that I don't uh, really find very good and very nice, I'm, I'm very favorable for the right holders is also the Creative Commons licenses are perpetual, it's forever. So, from, for me, every contract that the artist should have a certain limitation in time. Even for the contracts that are really bad, that pays you really bad, it's not good when they extend to 20, 30, 40 years. It should be limited. Giving away your rights for forever I think it's not really a sustainable model, but it can be used for the artists who are wishing to share their works on a different way, on a more interactive way, or like just by uh, giving reference, or like there are also some remuneration models too involved with that one, and Peter, I think, wants to talk more about that. Um, Creative Commons has a whole set of licenses that you can choose, actually. Yeah. So you can choose, you give away your work for free, and it can be changed and altered and used in any context. Or you can say, you give away the work for non-commercial use, but you reserve the rights for mm -hmm. commercial exploitation in case yeah. this is happening. You can say, this can only be reproduced if my name is attached to it. Yeah, so there are different sets, and I think the agency creative commons is always developing this further. Yeah. What this points out, so the claim, if you look at the promotional videos, is some rights reserved. 
No, yeah. The point is, and this is actually what it puts on you as an artist, is that you have decide for a specific career model. And some things work and some things don't work. If you make your income by workshops, you want that your works are circulating because this is your business card. And then Creative Commons might be an option for you for Absolutely. such things. Yeah? If you have a business model based on economy of scales and selling a lot of units, Creative Commons is definitely not so good for you. Yeah. If I just may add, uh, my office um, is the U.S. Copyright Office. We just hosted a week-long program last week, and we had Mike Carroll from Creative Commons, um, who some of you may know is a university professor. And so his intention in developing Creative Commons was initially for academics, because that is how they make their money, uh, as you pointed out. It's you want your textbook out there, you want your speeches out there, and that gets you invited to more fora and more workshops. Um, and I think the point in doing that initially was also because with technology today, once something gets posted on the internet, it's there forever, which is why I, uh, I believe is, is the reason why the licenses are perpetual, because there really is no way once it's posted in the virtual world to ever get it back. But the purpose of the licenses are to offer different uh, options for, for artists depending on, on, their, on their need. But, but you have to be really careful, because once you give away those rights, they're also gone forever. Yeah, it's just a kind of, in a way, also, um, I can sympathize with that one in the sense that it is a um, move on a good direction, maybe, in terms of dismantling the copyright. So, for instance, when you enter into contract to exploit your creation with a company, they usually tend to get everything in that one, okay? All the rights in that one. And I think it's in favor of the artist to be able to dismantle their rights. And now, for instance, choose on, okay, I wanna do, I wanna work with you for the um, printed publication of this work. I would like to keep the digital reproduction. I wanna give the performers of that one to another company. And then I would like to give, for instance, uh, the adaptation and rearrangement of rearrangement rights of these works to a friend of mine, so whatever it is. So it's to enable the artist to dismantle the rights and then use all of them separately or together, whatever it chooses. In that sense, Creative Commons is a useful tool to be able to do that. So I think that could uh, easily can bring us to the next subject, which is exclusivity. Uh, exclusivity can mean actually uh, several things for people and many of us can write, can actually like exclusivity which applies for ourselves, which is exclusive for us. Some could have more deeper commitments for exclusivity and then also can, can exclude the others from what they have. But some others cannot be very impressed for that one and then can say, well, actually, having options to try different things on a non-exclusive way could be more interesting for me. And so in that sense, I think it also brings again us to the basics of copyright law. So what is copyright? Is a kind of a conflict between different interests. Cynthia has just mentioned the first uh, art Article 1 of the Constitution, like about this copyright creations, which is promotion of useful art and science. And that's also a kind of, as I said, in the civil law European countries, the protection is based on the author, protect the author itself for the creation, and in others, protect the work itself. So it gives a protection to the author for a while, but afterwards, they 
for instance, US system is more uh, intended to give more access to works so public can access the art. And so that's actually creates the first uh, confrontation. So having exclusivity for author means also less access for a period of time for information or for art or asking to the right holder to access those works. But on the other hand, that's for the author who decides on the way of the usage of its work. And the other one is actually which creates artist earnings. So when you have exclusive rights, you decide on who to uh, who to give your rights or in which way you are giving those rights and um, doing that, by doing that you actually commercialize your work. So it gives artists earnings but it costs for the public so people need to pay to access those music. So these are the conflicting ideas for the copyright protection and it needs to be balanced in order to have a kind of sustainable society. So the creators are rewarded, they can continue to create, and after a while, and on, on, under certain conditions, the public can also access those works freely so they can actually use it for other purposes, such as, for instance, uh, create new works using those existing works. So, when you think it as a like, kind of shield that protects the copyright law, one part that gives you this exclusivity to control it, it gives you earnings from one side, and it also protects the original work that you create, so it is your work, and then if it is used by anyone else, so you can also get actually are rewarded for the creative input that you gave to the society so they create new things. On that way it's also uh, you might want to use some of the ideas, some of the expressions for other expressions that you would like to manifest but because the authors are in the position to permit the usage of their works, it in certain situations might um, restrict some others' freedom of expression because they cannot freely express everything that has been expressed in another context or in another way by someone else. And there are very close to that one, we have this moral rights issue that protects the personality of the right, which is actually best uh, put in German, which is like author's personality right, they call it. So it's just like there's a, a translation there, actually, you have the, when a usage um, disturbs the personality, the honor, the reputation, or the dignity of the author, the author has the right to stop that usage. It doesn't mean that's a commercial right, that's an economical right, but it's a moral right to stop that usage and not allow it. Even if they ask for the permission in the beginning, for instance, to record your music, they said, okay, I'm gonna record your music. You said, okay, you can do that. But the project, ends up to be like really bad for the reputation and the honor or the dignity of the author, it can still go and stop that usage. For instance, uh, this is one of the rights very much connected to this author's right protection because it protects personality. Um, that's why it doesn't exist in the US law, apart from with visual arts, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, and it's a relatively recent addition to our copyright law because it was believed for a long time that a copyright transferred not only what was contained in the tangible um, asset, whether it be a CD or a painting, the belief was that when I bought your CD, I 
not only got a copy, but I actually got all the rights. So people would turn around and make alterations and modifications to the copyright, which would compromise the integrity and reputation of an artist. So visual artists in our country finally got a law passed that uh, makes the separation between what's embedded in the actual tangible asset versus the actual copyright. So even if I now buy your painting, I can't turn around and put graffiti on it, slur words, and post it somewhere. Uh, you can sue me for that. Yeah. So are you familiar with the moral rights protection? Do you know what it is? I can actually give a kind of example on that one to explain it a little bit. It's very nice to also show the difference between the US and European system. There was a, a football player uh, who wanted to write a book about his life by used a ghostwriter. And then, so the book became a very big success. And then it also had publications in Europe. And then it became also very successful in France. The ghostwriter said, hey, I have moral rights. I am the writer of this book, and then I have the right to be, uh, to give, to be credited with my authorship of this work. So I won my rights. But actually, that was a little bit much more commercial point of view that the real author sought. So the judge actually said, well, okay, you have the right to be recognized with your work, but it doesn't mean that you can earn money from that. They just said, okay, it should be mentioned that the writer of that book is this one, but it doesn't actually <laughs> specifically mean that he gets to pay it. So <laughs> he gets paid for that one. Yeah, so with these moral rights things, on the other hand, on the internet, there are constantly different new uh, possibilities to mix, mash, and like the mockery on those works. Uh, you all the time give comments and then edit those works, but in a funny way, right? you joke or you parody on that one. And these are always also conflicting, as they always go for the author. It could put uh, it could put the art it could put the artist on a very funny or like kind of embarrassing situation sometimes. But would you tolerate that because it is? also freedom of expression or like people have this kind of rights or you don't have responsibility on the open blocks and these are the discussions also like kind of gives this conflict for the copyright protection and the people's intervention to that one. For music it's quite interesting that actually you have to ask for the permission to change your work under this. Yeah. But if you're a DJ, you never do that. <laughs> So there's a whole culture based. <laughs> yeah. No, but like there's this yeah. techno braga yeah. style in but Brazil. It was also shown in a movie, yeah. which is the music itself is based on mixing like kind of 20 songs by connecting all of them and then changing all the rhythms. But there is no actual other musical melody created in the work, but it is put in a context which is like completely different than the original work of the old separate 1520 works. But that's, yeah, there are like different, uh, uh, different implementations for that kind of things. You use like standard sampling uh, practices and then there are like kind of adopt, adapt, adaption arrangement and that kind of things. But it's a very, uh, very difficult area to you would like to say something? I'm sorry to keep interrupting, That's but I just right. wanted to add that this is probably the uh, the biggest difference between the American system of copyright and uh, and the rest of the world is oh, yes. we actually recognize a, a fair use defense, and it's considered a defense because you acknowledge that you're infringing someone's copyright, so you're actually taking something without the permission of the artist and you're turning around and you're changing it or you're parroting it or you're mocking it, but your argument is that it's fair use. And because the United States is very good about freedom of expression, it's actually something that you can rely on in the legal system. It's difficult um, to make the argument and there's a lot of criteria when you go to a court uh, that you have to argue it's various factors. Some of them have to do with financial um, 
um, remuneration and, and, and income, but a lot of them have to do with freedom of expression. And I believe we're the only ones in the world that, as of today, have a fair use uh, carve out in our copyright law system. Yeah, well, I mean, fair use is a kind of uh, a little bit more free structure in the US law. Uh, but actually, every law has a kind of, I mean, as I said, it's starting from here, actually. It's about the exclusivity of the right and the right of the people to access those works. And you cannot always in a position to ask or to pay every usage of the work. So the laws are supposed to um, give you some options where actually you do not need to ask the permission of the right holder. So the exclusivity stops. And those situations are called as the exceptions to copyright or limitations to copyright. In UK copyright law, I'm not right in saying, I'm not a lawyer to with this. Um, I'd have a much sharper <laughs> suit. Uh, I'd have a better suit. Um, is, is this the same as the right of paternity, which is, which is, as we understand it, the right to be credited for your creation of your work? That's a moral right. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's the same. It's within this area. Yeah, well, that's, that's about the moral rights, yeah, yes. Yeah. That's it, the, it's just named that way. And that's yeah, like the right of paternity, the right of attribution, it's, a, it's one of the moral rights. One of them is the right of dignity, right, the right of in integrity, sorry. So, for instance, nobody can change your work in a way that is harmful to your honor and reputation. Yeah, but these limitations and exceptions are something different. Like, for instance, for educational purposes, you give some information or like you use a piece of music or like as an academician you use a bit from a book and then you give reference to that one or for making news so you need to use for instance some of the um, audiovisual assets of a concert in order to report on that one so that also falls under the copyright protection and for instance in many, in many countries it exists, there's a, cop, a private copying exception which doesn't exist in the UK. So, for instance, you can make copies of a work for your own personal usage. So these are the, these are the things that actually doesn't really, uh, these are the things that limitations, exceptions to copyright, you don't have to ask the permission anymore. And this could also be parody, for instance. In many countries, parody is also an exception, but it's not always as wide and as comprehensive, exclusive as in the US now. But there are actually some of the things that laws actually need to tolerate some of the usages in order, in order to ensure non-commercial and like personal or like educational or like go for society usages. I just have a maybe more theoretical question, but copyright, of course, is more about the protection of, it's about the protection of the artist, about the creator. But do I, as a member of the vast majority of the audience or the public, do I have a right as well? Can I, for instance, do I have the right for not being exposed, I would not even say to bad music, but <laughs> to music? <laughs> uh, well, I don't think so. so you just switch it off. Probably. No, but I walk into public space, so I'm just referring to what, what's happening now everywhere, that, that you're not allowed to smoke inside, blah, 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 all these things, and, and probably uh, you will not uh, be allowed to smoke outside. Mm -hmm. So then, the step towards music is, is, is very little. I mean, one could say no music in public spaces because I protest, I don't want this Christmas music for six weeks, <laughs> just to give an example. <laughs> You know these jingle bells? Yeah. <laughs> First, there are laws, but they're not copyright laws. There are like health laws, laws against noise pollution, sound limitations, and so on. It's other body of law. Second, when the city of Linz was the cultural capital, they ran a program about silence. So they branded actually places that for the time of this program they stopped to play this background music and they made a big fuss and actually they managed also 
a political decision of the parliament of the city to ban these kind of things. So you get now a kind of um, sound ecology movement that is trying to get these things into the law. So there are, there's, there's even, we, we, we celebrate the music day, but there's also the day, the no music day. <laughs> so, so this, it's a serious issue, number one, and second, subject to other laws, and third, there's real civil movement around this topic. And it would help as well to restore the respect for copyright. Yeah. If it has both sides. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lawsuit, copyright lawsuit. Yeah. Somebody put up 433 silence. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Record, recorded the silence and asked for the protection on the sound recording. <laughs> yeah. When, <laughs> when you mentioned about the um, no music, they came to mind in Accra in Ghana. The guys have a festival, and before the festival, there will be ban on drumming, on music. So, like um, six weeks, yeah. I think it's a month, a whole month, and no music, loud music in the church, no out, outside uh, performances. And sometimes we, the musicians, feel bad because that month, everything goes slow. Yeah, you know? but, but, yeah, about a month ago or like two months ago, was it Uganda, one of the African countries, in order to raise awareness for copyright protection, all radios didn't play any music for one day and only had uh, panel talks about copyright law to punish the <laughs> people to actually go for more better, to ask better copyright protections to their lawmakers so they can listen to music again instead of all talks about copyright law. So. <laughs> okay, so yeah, as I said, like this exclusivity which makes copyright protected and which makes artists get paid. And we have limitations, exceptions, fair usages that actually allows public on certain cases not to ask for a copyright law. But now there are also, well as I said, like the international conventions and the law says that you can use the copyright without permission in certain cases which are described under the law and, and that doesn't actually uh, prejudice the commercial rights of the authors or remunerate the authors on another way. So that's the so-called three-step test in the, con in the convention. So you look at the situation, if it is described in the law like fair use or as an exception in the law, and if it is only for those cases that are used and it doesn't necessarily affect the earnings of the author. It doesn't compete with the commercial exploitation of the author, but it still gives the author remuneration on another way. For instance, with this private copying exception, only, I mean, having a CD and putting it on your MP3 or computer doesn't compete with the commercial character of the right because you wouldn't buy the same CD twice, the same music twice, just to put it there and then there. And for the private copying levies, all the, dev uh, the devices that has the capability of recording also pay a royalty to the collecting societies, which eventually goes to right holders. So the right holders are remunerated in another way for that reproduction. Um, but nowadays with the technology and with the new services, and all those changes in the new media. I love this new media work, by the way. Everything is called new media now, so it's just the media itself, actually, nowadays. <laughs> but everything is new, and a lot of things that are called new media are not new anymore, anyway. <laughs> so, and yeah, those allow us actually to do many things uh, that we are not in position to ask for permission, for instance. Um, I mean, For instance, when you go to on YouTube, you upload a music as a reproduction, and then that is performed on the platform or YouTube. It's a performance. So you are not in a position, maybe, I mean, you're not in a position to go and ask for the permission of that one. So what is going? In Germany, GEMA controls YouTube. Yeah. 
I mean, in, in Germany, German, GEMA controls YouTube, and sometimes they try to access and they say, it's not allow, allowed in your country to see this movie. Yes. Or IP, they control also IP and... Uh, Abs absolutely. I mean, you're perfect to find. What, um, now we have this um, internet service providers, internet content providers, those web pages, um, which is called this web three, web two things. So, and there's this web page. It's a user-generated content mostly. A company holds the platform to which everyone has access and can post something. Legally, the platform does not have legal responsibility for the works that are posted on the platform by the users of that one. For instance, the blogs. You have a blog about an issue and then people start to swear there or like say ridiculous things or like, I mean, for instance, like swear to you or like say something against government, tells that one to there, but everybody has access there and then the owner of the blog does not have an editorial control on the web page Hence, is not legally responsible for the content that is posted by the users of that web page. So that was one of the first things uh, that was laid down as a law for the e-commerce services, e-commerce directives, e-commerce laws, in order to boost the new online services so people can have more interactive usages and then they can go for the new online services and that they can contribute so a new sector, a new market can easily develop. But now there is a new business around that, like Google for instance. There you, you post there, but for instance, what the collecting societies do, because YouTube has become a platform not only for amateur users sharing their wedding videos or like last holidays with their family or like the funny accident that they have on the street. It is also a platform for many artists to promote their music or like for many film companies or TV companies to test their new products and to actually show, their, show what they are doing. And nowadays also a lot of, I mean, everybody using new mobile phones and the internet and iPads tablets, different tablets, they always search for a visual reference for the music that they want to listen or for a project, musical project that they hear. Everybody looks, they have devices, everybody looks for a visual reference too. So that's a new area. That's why for the professionally used mu music, usually collecting societies collect money. So the way to do that, Google gives you three options. When you post, well, when your music is used on a platform, okay, by you or by someone else, you have the right to go to Google and say, okay, my music is being used. I'm not happy with that one. I want to commercialize this. I want to earn money from that one. So Google puts advertisements around that video, and then when it's clicked by people, so it generates money which is shared between Google and the right holder. You can say, I'm fine, people are using my work on YouTube and Google's. I don't care, they can use it, so you, you don't do anything, you leave it. Or you say, hey, you've been using all my works and all my programs, productions, without asking, which becomes a new way of exploitation. I don't want them you should remove them, and they, they take down that content. But, yeah? But it depends on the country where you are. It depends on the country, because some videos, I say, uh, my family can see in Brazil, but I can see in Germany. Yeah. Because it's controlled. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But then the law, it's because of, I mean, the connection is, the artist is connected to this collecting society, and this collecting society has the right to yeah. Uh, to act yeah. in, the, yeah. in a territory. The collecting societies have the authority to act only in the country that they operate. 
Uh, but yeah, okay, in, this YouTube thing is uh, quite interesting because it's so popular that uh, since it is controlled in some countries, but we still can find material uh, that are probably uh, in copyright law, uh, where we can, you know, uh, watch a, a whole movie, a whole documentary, or a concert, and what happens to the copyright then? Absolutely. In, well, I mean, a lot of right holders around the world, now it's actually very harsh in the US nowadays. Viacom has a big case against Google and YouTube. So, because all the series on Viacom, when they are started to, for instance, first shown in New York, it started to be shown in San Francisco, which is like, there's already six hours difference, so you can even watch it before it is, <laughs> it is shown on the TV, so <laughs> if you just a follow on the internet, so that also becomes a new way of exploitation for the work. And then people do it as soon as they're published, like simultaneously almost. And that's why the content owners start cases. But as I said, uh, we are, with the copyright law, usually used to have this control-based exclusivity that requires prior authorization. Uh, we are willing to set the conditions before the usage so we can decide how it will be used, how, will, how I will be paid, what will be the royalties. So, in which conditions the works will be used, when it will be used, or like in what ways, and do we have this contractual freedom to decide on those issues about the exploitation of that one? Just a minute, please, Steph. And we are used to have this right holder oriented thing, but now it is, as I said, this paradigm change in the copyright law. Google what Google offers to you is you need to find out that your work is used and then afterwards you can decide whether you want to commercialize it or you, you just leave it for free or you want to remove it. I can do that, I'm happy to do that, it says. But it's a subsequent action. It's not the prior authorization anymore. That's the difference. So that means you don't have the first contractual freedom to set the conditions of the usage of your work. And you are not able to create a strategy according to the model, the new ways of exploitation. You might want to choose different strategies for different usages. Uh, you, want, you can easily want to have that right to be able to do that. So, but there is a new change going to that part, which comes like the protection comes afterwards. So there are also like new laws that says there should be more exclusive, uh, there should be more compulsory licenses. So you should make the work available, they can use, but they should pay you afterwards. Okay, we are happy that we want to pay, but we don't want to ask you before you use it, so we just want to use it, and then we can set a certain amount of time that is to be paid by everyone, so we're going to do that. But that is... That is one of the first things that makes you lose these parts and that uh, makes you able to monetize that part and which actually removes this part. Because it, is, it creates easier access to content by normal users or by commercial users. And it is only provided to stop if you are not happy. That was actually throughout the development of the copyright. That's very funny. Uh, the other day we were sitting uh, in a session and then we were supposed to speak with our neighbor sitting next to us. And then a lady from European Broadcasting Union asked me, does, does copyright progress? I was a kind of, okay, so what should I say about that? <laughs> Does it progress? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, for whom? Or is it that kind of things? So, I mean, uh, in the, for instance, in the earlier versions of the treaties on the performers' right, for instance, performers had the right only to stop 
the usages of their work if they are not happy with that one. But in time, more parts of the right become exclusive so to enable them, enable them to authorize or prevent the usages of those rights in, instead of to stop that one. Are you going to ask I just, something? I just wanted to know how long, what's the timing? Um, if, if we make a little funny movie here and we put it on the internet, it may be a hit this evening. Yeah. So, but maybe in, in between, I would not be able to get Mr. Google online asking if yeah. we can make a deal. So, what is. No, because. And sometimes it goes fast. No, no, absolutely. But the thing is, normally, um, in normal content that you post on YouTube when you search, there is no advertisement. If you want to commercialize it, you ask Google to set up some structure to commercialize that one, and then it puts, and then it puts ads around the content. So then every time your video is clicked, you start to earn money. But that's what I'm saying. It started to get very famous. So you decide, oh, okay, so I mean, it gets started to be very famous. Maybe I should commercialize. I should monetize that one. You ask them, and then they answer you, and then they set up the structure, and then you are paid only for those clicks after uh, they put the advertisements. Uh, I, I, I never tried that. They always say that they try their best in answering in due course. I heard some people having very effective communications. I heard some people asking 100 times in months to remove the content or like to get money and never get a reply. I don't think there is a like very consistent, um, like very, I don't know, I, mean, I, I, heard, I, heard, I heard both in different conferences. I never did it on my own, but I heard both sides. I want to go back to YouTube again. Uh, yeah. uh, let's say I have made, um, I have a DVD mm -hmm. of my concerts and uh, it's sold in the market, mm -hmm. but uh, somebody uh, uses or puts parts of that DVD in the YouTube. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? What do you do? Well, that's this, uh, part of the same strategy that YouTube offers to you. So you find out that your works is being used very widely on YouTube. And now you decide on commercializing that. So what YouTube does, it recognizes the work uh, in audio version and visual version and as audio visual version. So it has like, in order to have a like quite good control about the content, and for instance, the music can be used in another context with another video, which could become also very famous, like the dancing of small funny children on a well-known music is like the kind of uh, <laughs> brand for YouTube, I guess. Uh, uh, or it could be only the visual aspect that, become more uh, that becomes more popular than the sound expert. And then there is also the audiovisual one. So they recognize it in three formats. And then Google starts to run they um, like I'm starts to run a system to recognize the usage of every visual, audio, and audiovisual formats on its platform, and then for every asset, they start to count on that one. So that's the way that they use. So do you have to prove uh, yourself as this is my work to YouTube or do they do? Yeah, that's one of the actually other things that YouTube, of course, doesn't want to do. <laughs> I mean, of course, it's, it's not in a position to do it either, actually. I mean, when you look from a logic perspective, you say, that's my work. And then Google needs to go like a million times a day to search if that work matches with the work in a, for instance, copyright registry or in a work in the collecting society. They trust in that one, but of course, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of monies there which are sometimes created without like having really, unless someone else claims the same thing or unless there is a confusion on that one. So 
there, I think there are a lot of monies lost or like earned but cannot be distributed on a Google. And I saw in a conference some Google representatives saying they had like a lot of money that they cannot spend and then keep it somewhere. So We had a, a, a funny story going on in Belgium a couple of weeks ago yeah. when there was a, a movie Go, a little uh, movie going on, on on YouTube, and it was uh, two people rather roughly making love on a tower somewhere in Greece a couple of years ago. Uh, this, was, this was filmed by amateurs. They saw it, they filmed it. So it was on the internet for quite a long time, and now recently somebody discovered that the lady is the actual mayor of a city in Flanders. <laughs> So, of course, it became a hit. <laughs> now my question, can she capitalize on this? <laughs> Since she is a performing artist, I mean. <laughs> no, but can she, would she be able to stop it? She would, yes, absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely, yes. Yes. So there are like, I mean, there are different versions of that kind of cases. For instance, kids abusing a disabled uh, people in the school and then put it on YouTube and then it creates also like kind of discrimination and violence and that kind of thing. So, so you can also remove those content for other reasons uh, than the copyright. This would never happen in Scotland of course because it's too, <laughs> it's too, it's too cold, you know. You, you, you die screwing on the beach. Um, uh, worth a try maybe but uh, now, the question I have is, is really going back to copyright and the European picture while we have you here. And that is, if you remember in Helsinki three years ago when we had the first meeting of the European Composers Forum, we had with us in that occasion, you were there, Steph, weren't you? We had new accession member states to the European community. Uh, Estonia, Latvia, um, Lithuania. And I do remember that at that time, uh, only three years ago, nearly four years ago now, uh, the copyright situation in these countries, they must become, copyright is EU law. It's, it's you know, it's, it, it's, it's a devolved legislation that we all, we all as member states recognize. Uh, it has some variations, mm -hmm. but it's essentially what you've described is yeah. what is copyright law. Yeah. Are these countries now including the one we're in, is, are these countries now absolutely up to speed and are their authors and performers as, as well protected as the expectation that those of us that work, you know, have, have had for many years? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, that's, there are a lot of problems in many countries. And, I mean, if you, when you work, for instance, with a big music company, there is actually no country in Europe that applies good corporate laws anyway. So <laughs> that's also a little bit subjective too. But yes, there are a lot of problems. I was the other day with a colleague of mine who works here in the Tartu and Tallinn University giving intellectual property courses. He's been involved with many technical trainings at the government, at the courts, and at the institutions. And I was talking with the gentleman from the Ministry of Culture of Estonia yesterday and the lady from the Estonian radio and since they introduced the new laws apparently they had a lot of problems to convince the TV and radio stations to provide playlists and I was discussing that with a gentleman from Malaysia today who was one of the farmers of the Performing Grass Association from there. They had the same things, for instance, when they adhered to Bern Convention in 1993. Afterwards, everything was being used for free by commercial users. And now you just start to get in a situation where you go and ask them for money for the same things that they had been doing for free. So that's also like a lot of this kind of tension. And the key point in that one, if you would like to apply those laws or if you would like to adhere to a certain level of protection in one sense, you need to have a political support. So you need to be able to go with the police, for instance, to TV stations and then ask them nicely to provide those playlists or you should be able to take them to court to pay for those royalties if they don't you come up with 
multiply the months <laughs> as a punishment. So that's the political uh, intention of the country, the political dedication of the countries. But they are catching up. There are a lot of problems. The main problems with the uh, most of the new member states, and actually in most of the member states, actually, apart from several of them, uh, the structure that the rights are managed, for instance, by collecting societies too. The infrastructure, the technical infrastructure, is very weak to be able to control the digital usages and to be able to report on them transparently and correctly for the right holders so they can see when their works are used, how many times, in what territories, and how much they are entitled to get. So that's the main, or like, who is the owner of that right from a commercial user's, user's point of view. I'm going to have an international music service. The rights of the Estonian artists are in the Estonian Collecting Society. The British artists are, or the Scottish artists are at PRS. So you have some major music publishers that license directly. There are some French musicians who are registered in Germany. So I'm going to offer a multi-repertoire, multi-territory license and everybody wants to charge me. And theoretically, everybody represents most of the rights and then provide me with the global repertoire. But I'm not able to see for what I am paying for. Or am I paying <coughs> for the same songs at three different points or not? So that's the why. Well, actually, our time is out. And the other issue was the Fair Music Initiative. We didn't have time to talk about it very much, but uh, what I could advise is Fair Music Initiative, is, as I said, is a new initiative for the fairness in the music industry. It sets standards for the contracts between artists and recording companies, artists and live venues, and artists and online companies. So when they enter to those relations with those companies, they can refer to that contractual standards to have a better deals. So primarily it deals with these three ways of exploitation at the moment, but it will be developed as a project for all, uh, all ways of exploitation in the music sector. It uh, aims fairness, equality, more access, cultural diversity, better freedom of expression, so less advantaged artists can also be uh, recognized. And it gives the support for and new ways of uh, new entrepreneurials, and then it also touches the nature, the core of the rights, so the artists are protected. And it is also a very nice project from a consumer's point of view, so you can see that's a fair music project. So if you use that one also from illegal copies or like sharing it with a million people, you know that you are actually stealing from the artist, not from the company. And if you are happy to pay for the music, you know that artists in those uh, production is fairly remunerated. Where we are is we have a focus group formed by musicians, managers, lawyers, record labels, online companies, uh, music promoters, some collecting societies, uh, musicians unions, and also grouping of independent labels. And we are talking, I mean, we are discussing the standards by the way should be like this long or this long or they should be that way or that way. So you can search them from the web page actually. There's a very nice web page and then the standards on <coughs> recording contracts are already there. And we are also running a study right now. It's called Fair Music Business Model which will be public soon. And I'm writing the legal aspects of that one. Music Information Center Austria makes the market research and the kind of applicability of that service. And then Feder the Musicians Unions Federation has run a survey among the members. And so we're gonna set up the agency, start to become operational, and then pu publish this study too. So I'm not gonna want, I don't want to keep you any longer. But that's the main information. You can find more about that on the webpage, and I will be more than happy to talk more about that if you have any questions on this. Apart from that, thanks very much for your patience and for your contribution.